Good Friday, a day for us to be able to remember the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My name is Trent Jenkins, and thank you so much for joining us today at North Coast Church as we go through this Easter experience of reflecting on Good Friday. I want to take a moment and prepare you for what's going to take place the rest of our time here today. In just a moment, we're going to turn things over to Kurt and Macy, who are going to lead us in a song of worship. You can feel free to sing along, but really this is a time for us to be able to reflect on what it is that Christ has done for us, to be able to collect our thoughts and to remember all of his goodness and his sacrifice that he has given to each and every one of us. And then I'm going to lead us through what's called the Stations of the Cross. Essentially, it's a journey of Jesus' final moments leading up to his death and crucifixion. In each one of these stations, I will set up the scene for us. And at the end, I will end up putting up the scripture at the screen for you to be able to read on your own. I also want to encourage you, we have provided a PDF of this entire experience for you to be able to download so that you and others can be able to utilize it to be able to go through these stations. There's also interactive activities included in this worksheet to be able to get the most out of this experience. We've also provided a family-friendly PDF so that you can lead your family through this as well. As part of these activities, some of them are going to include different items like communion. We want to encourage you, go ahead and hit pause, gather those items so that when the moment arrives, you can go ahead and proceed. I want to encourage you, gather the bread, juice, maybe grab a piece of paper and a pen so that you can write down some notes as we go through this journey together. Lastly, We've made this production very simple so that we can eliminate most of the distractions that often distract us from getting the true meaning out of what it is that we're doing. I wanna encourage you to do the exact same thing. Eliminate the distractions in your own life right now. Let's set aside this time so that we can really reflect on who Jesus is and all that he's done for us. Maybe you need to dim the lights so that you can focus in. Maybe you need to put the kids outside if they're not going to join you for this experience. Or maybe you just need to find a quiet time and place. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. And then we're going to join in with Kurt and Macy. Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for us being able to remember your sacrifice and understanding that we would not have forgiveness of sins without your death, without the shedding of your blood, without your sacrifice. Help us to be able to reflect on our lives and all of the moments that we're proud of and and moments that we we regret and realize that you've been with us through them all and you've been championing us. You've been cheering us on because you want us to be able to be with you in heaven one day. Thank you for your sacrifice and help us to be able to reflect as we move forward. In your name, amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
ever so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, His mercy. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this, Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and will rejoice with you all. What is a drink offering? Why would we do such a thing? In Exodus, it talks about many different offerings that can be offered to the Lord, but one of them was referred to as a drink offering, and one of them was referred to as a grain offering. It was an act of sacrifice, of worship, towards the Lord. In the book of Mark, we see in these final days, this woman comes into this home where Jesus is dining. It's Simon the leper's house. And she takes this alabaster jar filled with perfume and she walks up to Jesus and she breaks this jar over his head, anointing him with oil, the Bible says. 
Can you imagine this moment for this woman to walk into a home, somebody else's home, filled with men, all lounging, dining? Can you imagine the heart palpitations that she's having in this moment, doing something completely bizarre? This is not tradition to be able to be done. Yet she feels impressed that this is what she's supposed to be doing to Jesus. She goes and she breaks this jar of perfume and they said it was extremely costly. Why was this done and why not just give this to the poor? And Jesus says, stop bothering her. You don't know what she's doing. She's worshiping me. And in this moment, she pours out an offering and anoints him. She doesn't even know what she's doing and why she's necessarily doing it at the moment. But little does she know Jesus looks at it and it's referred to in the book of John is that she's preparing him for his burial. She's preparing him with these aromas since he will be dead. But here she is. She's anointing him with the oil before he dies. An ultimate act of worship. And I just wonder for me in this moment, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? When's the last time you've poured yourself out to Jesus and given him all of your love and praise that I'm going to do something that's bizarre and maybe different, but it is going to be an act of love, of sacrifice towards him. In these next few moments, I'd love for you to read through this story and to see this woman's act of sacrifice and Jesus' response towards her. Read through the story and then Kurt's going to come back on and just repeat some of what we sang through just a moment ago. And I want you to really reflect on these words and contemplate the love that you have for Jesus and ultimately realizing that the sacrifice of this perfume was nothing in comparison to the sacrifice of his life. As we continue to worship here, we just want to reflect on what our Lord and Savior did on that cross for us. So let's sing this chorus one last time. Oh, to be like you. Oh, to be like you and give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Ever the hope in my heart Lift it up to Him Oh, to be like You And give all I have just to know You Jesus, there's no one beside You Forever the hope in my heart Here we are at station number two. And I want to start our time off in Exodus chapter 12, reflecting on Moses' words to the people of Israel as they are in the land of Egypt and going through the season of plagues. And he tells all the people of Israel to go out and get a spotless lamb, the firstborn lamb. Bring it into your house and you're going to sacrifice that lamb. And then you're going to take the blood of the lamb and put it into a bowl You're going to take a hyssop branch and dip it into this bowl and then you're going to spread it over the doorframe of your house. This will be a sign to the angel of death that they pass over your house, saving you and your family. And you are going to remember this day, the rest of your life and generations to come because we will always celebrate this day. This to me is this picture as we set up the Passover meal. As Jesus has already entered into Jerusalem, 
He's already gone through Palm Sunday and the celebration of him arriving and people thinking that a political leader, one who would save them from Rome, was coming. And here they go into an upper room, one that's prepared for them, and Jesus leads them in this Passover meal. One that is traditional, one that has been done for generation after generation. Do you have any family traditions like that? You just do them and sometimes you forget why. But on this day, the Passover meal is going to take a different tone. When Jesus says and takes the bread and says that I, I am the bread. I am the life. And even in John 6, 36, says, I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He says, I am this bread. And when you break it, know that this is my body broken for you. And when you take it and you eat it, you remember that the sacrifice was done for you. It says in the same way, he took the cup. And for them, it would have been wine, traditional to be able to be used Remembering the sacrifice of that lamb there on Passover that gave them the right to not be killed in that moment. This blood, he said, is my blood poured out for you. When you drink, you remember my sacrifice. But let us also remember that this cup, symbolic of his blood, It's what gives us the right to be passed over from death. When we ultimately die, we do not die spiritually, just physically. And it's this blood, his sacrifice, that pays for our sins. There is nothing I can do, there is nothing you can do that can earn his forgiveness. It was a gift, redeeming us, buying us back from the gates of Hades so that we can go to the gates of heaven. At this point in time, I want to encourage you, read through the passages, whether they're on the screen or on your PDF. As you go through communion, take time and reflect and realize this isn't a traditional moment. This is a moment for us to reflect. In this moment, Jesus shows us that he's going to give us life. Station number three, we exit the upper room and we go to the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And this garden isn't one that you and I might think of where you and I live. This garden was an olive grove. And on this hillside where the garden is, where this olive grove, it overlooks the city of Jerusalem. It's just outside the walls. And there amongst the olive trees is an olive press. They would keep the olive press right there so that they could collect the barrelfuls of olives and bring them in. And they throw all of the olives onto the press. And then they put this massive stone on top of the olives and it rolls around, crushing all of the olives, crushing it and crushing it and crushing it until the olive oil seeps out over the side. It's ironic that in this moment, Jesus goes to a garden with olive trees and olive oil. And it symbolizes the pressing burden and being crushed by the weight of the world and all that will occur. And in this moment, he has an unbelievable prayer. There's a lot of moments in Jesus' life that I'm in awe of. And there's some where I feel like, wow, Maybe Jesus gets me too. And in this moment, he cries out to his dad, his father. 
And he says that the worry and the burden that I'm facing is too much to the point of death. I don't know. Have you ever been there in your life where it just feels the weight of the world is too much? And Jesus, at the end of his prayer, says, if, it's, if this can't be saved, if this is the only way, then your will be done. Jesus knows what it is to be heavy burdened. Jesus knows what it is to have the weight of the world on his shoulders. And far too often we look at Christianity and faith as though it's supposed to make all of our lives easier. And Jesus shows us by example that sometimes obedience is not easy. But he does say the weight of following me is easy. Matthew chapter 11, it says, Come to me, all who labor and are a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He wants you and I to be able to find rest in him because he already paid the price for us. He took the way to the world, the burden of sin on his shoulders. And he gave us the opportunity to be able to just follow in his steps, to be able to experience the freedom that he's already given to us as a gift. So on that day, he cried out to his father to the point where it says that he cried tears of blood because of the worry, the anxiety. He did this. He went ahead and was obedient because of you and because of me. Because without his sacrifice, we wouldn't have freedom and there couldn't be forgiveness. So as we read through this story, I want to encourage you. What area in your life are you distressed? And know that Jesus knows what it is to be distressed and that we can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. He cares for you. At station number four, we reflect on the actions after the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had concluded praying and woke up his disciples because they had already fallen asleep. And he saw in the distance the Roman centurions coming for him. They end up taking him away. And there in the midst of all of the hustle and bustle, Peter trails behind, wondering, watching what will take place to Jesus, his Savior, and his friend. Earlier in the night, Jesus had already told Peter that he would betray him three times before the rooster crowed. Peter, of course, denied, no, Lord, no, not me, not me. Have you ever said to yourself, no, not me? Not me, I'm not going to do that again. Not me, I'm going to be faithful. Not me, I, I won't lie in that way. Not me, I won't betray. Yet we have all fallen into this same boat. And Jesus being the one to be able to forgive is the only one that can take that burden from us. When you and I live our lives, every time we do something in disobedience to the Lord, we put on the weight of sin. And every sin is an additional weight. And that weight and that burden becomes heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And interestingly enough, there's moments in, in Scripture where Jesus ends up healing those just because they have something where they have an infirmity, blind, deaf, whatever it may be. And there's moments where he says, your sins are forgiven and then the person is healed. It's amazing what the weight of sin can do. It can distort 
not just our minds and our ears and our eyes, but our bodies literally weighing on us the weight of the world and causing infirmity and causing sickness. Jesus says, you are forgiven. But have you brought your burdens to him? Have you counted the cost of the sins maybe in your own life? So these rocks just represent the heavy things in our life. And maybe it's how I mistreated that person today. Or that broken relationship that I never really sought forgiveness for. That time that I cheated and I knew that I shouldn't have. All of the things that I put into my mind that I know time and time Jesus has asked me not to. But it just seems so right. And we keep on piling these rocks of weight, of sin in our life. And then they get real heavy. And Peter on that night, when he betrays Jesus three times, says that he breaks down and he weeps. And I don't know where you're at, but maybe this story is a little bit of an encouragement to you that Jesus can take the weight, he can take the weight of our sin, the weight of our world, and he can bring us freedom. Station number five, we've come to the cross. Jesus was just put on trial. The Sanhedrin have accused him of blasphemy. Pilate finds no wrong, but ultimately really releases Barabbas instead of him. He releases a criminal and sends Jesus to a criminal's death. He's given the cross and is put onto his back, which has been flogged with a cat of nine tails, shredding his back exposing it to the beam and to the splinters of the weight of that wood. And he's forced to go up the Via de la Rosa or the way of suffering as it leads to Golgotha where he would be crucified. And on this path, he's spit upon and mocked by those who I'm sure he's preached to, to those who he's done miracles for and in front of. And here in this moment, they mock him. Why don't you save yourself, they say. He's brought to the top. He's laid upon the cross. And nails are driven through his wrists and through his feet. He's raised up for the entire world to see as a mockery that this new sect called the Way would die with its leader. But this piece of wood, the cross, is a symbol. It has no magical power or authority. It is merely a symbol. What once was considered an element and symbol of death, upon Jesus' death, it now symbolizes life. Because he gave us life through the shedding of his blood on that cross. And in the midst of it, he felt the weight of the world. In the midst of it, he felt every bit of that pain. He was fully human. He was fully man. And not once did he use his authority and his power to get himself off that cross. Not once did he use it for the gain of himself, but he used it and he poured himself out so that you and I could experience life. It's talked about a thousand years before in the book of Psalms in chapter 22. And it reads, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? In verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my, boing, my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt or sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. But you, Lord, 
Do not be far from me. You are my strength. My strength. Come quickly to help me. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. The words of David and prophecy of what it is that Jesus would go through. His suffering for you and for me. And today we can look at this symbol as just a symbol of Christianity, a symbol of death, or we can view this symbol of the cross as a symbol of life, not because of anything that you and I have done, but because of the power of Jesus' blood being shed for you and I. A spotless, perfect lamb being that sacrifice, the only sacrifice that would be acceptable to God our Father. And so today we, we take the burdens of our life and the sin and the weight of this world and you and I can't do anything with this weight except give it to Jesus and accept his free gift, his free sacrifice so that you and I can have life. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, throw off all the weight of sin that entangles you. And today I want to let you know, you don't need to keep carrying this burden with you any longer. You can experience the freedom of Christ in your life if you ask for forgiveness and repent of your ways and turn from them and recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then the blood he shed covers you, and makes you white as snow and God separates it as far as the east is from the west. I invite you today, maybe take a pen and paper and write out the sins of your life. Just write them out and as you do, then maybe shred it up or throw it into the fire and symbolically giving those things over to him and saying no more. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice and that you forgave me. And today, God, I declare no more. I will live for you. Let's give them our burdens today. Station number six. We hear Jesus' final words, it is finished. On that, it says that the curtain of the temple was torn into two. The temple was always separated by this massive curtain from the Holy of Holies, and where the priests could go, and then where the people could go, and then where the Gentiles could go. And in this one moment, he tears that curtain in two, giving us access to God the Father. That you and I now have access to Him. It's on Good Friday where our sins are forgiven. It's on Easter where Jesus defeats death. But without Friday, without His sacrifice, without the shedding of His blood, we wouldn't have forgiveness. And so today, you and I can reflect and rejoice in the forgiveness that each you and I can receive and have and walk in freedom. And I love what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion. Let's not let this moment pass by as another moment of tradition or religion. But this is a moment where we reflect on the sacrifice and love of our Savior and we figure out how it is in our normal day-to-day -day life that we will live it out to where we reflect his light, his life, and his love. Right now we're going to enter in with one last song of worship. And as we do, I pray that the love of Christ washes over you and overwhelms you, that his goodness and his riches would overwhelm you, that you would understand the fullness and greatness of the love of our Father.
can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. And take this life and breathe on. This heart that is. can have it all, Lord, every part of my world, and take this life and breathe on, with this heart that is now and all the joy
can have it all Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now Thank you so much for joining us today as we have reflected of Jesus' love and sacrifice for each and every one of us on this Good Friday. If you have any prayer requests, you'd like someone to be able to pray over something in your life, simply text it into this phone number, 844-921-0220. We have people that would love to be able to pray over a burden, a specific incident or situation in your life. We also would like to be able to invite you to our Easter services. We'll be hosting an Easter service right here online, a part of our online ministry. And we have many different Easter services at all of our campuses. I invite you to go to our website to be able to check local times for your service. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you at one of our Easter services.